All right, so we'll get started. Okay. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, I should say thanks, first of all, uh, in spite of having a cricket match happening, you guys are here to listen to us. Uh, my name is Prasad. I work for a company called Ideas. Uh, I manage uh, two product lines of Ideas. Uh, and he's Naresh. Of course, everyone knows him. So today, uh, we are going to share our journey the transition of legacy code to make sure that we follow the engineering practices, the agile engineering practices in the legacy code. So I'll start with the question, what, what do you mean by legacy code? Any, anyone? Code without, without code without tests. Perfect. What else? Which exists for? Yeah, so which exists for years and years together. OK. What else? The code which we are scared to touch. If there are 10 ifs, if else conditions, new, chair, new requirements uh, help makes us put 11th else condition, right? So we are just scared about legacy code, right? OK. The code with uh, no continuous feedback, no test cases running, no CI, CD integration. So we don't know if we make any changes, what will happen. A lot of manual testing, right? All right. So here is our journey. So I'll start. So we, as I said, I, I manage uh, two products. For one of the products, uh, uh, we faced a similar situation where there was no co code coverage, there was no test cases running, and no CI, CD integration. So here is the journey. As India is batting in Sydney, we'll bat for the next 35 minutes. Hopefully, we won't get out. So let's, be, let's, let's hear us. Kind of quickly to set the context, uh, I'm sure people have stayed at the hotels, and we understand that you know, the price that is quoted to you when you come into a hotel, uh, depending on who you are, where you come from, how frequently you stay, the price keeps varying. right? And that's essentially, in a nutshell, if I were to describe what Ideas does. Uh, you know, one of the products of Ideas basically helps hotels uh, quote the best optimal price to different kinds of customers uh, so that they can maximize their revenue. Uh, while they started in that space, I think uh, there was a lot of uh, demand for the analytics, that the engine that they had built. And they kind of spread out into another vertical, which is the air, uh, the airport uh, car parking vertical. In general, car parking, but specifically airport car parking vertical. So just as a data point, uh, the entire Heathrow Airport, when you go to the London Heathrow Airport, the car parking is managed by the software. Right? And this was the first uh, deployment that we had of this product. Right, so back in 2007, we built this product uh, mainly for the Heathrow as the first uh, beta client. And uh, we are very excited, you know, that because you can imagine the car parking industry, uh, if, if, we, if I have to talk about that, uh, if you have to sell a hotel room, I can only sell one night, one room at a time, right? But especially for the car parking lots, if I say the average length of stay that a car stays in the parking lot is one hour, so technically I can sell the same parking lot 24 times, right? So there is a whole, whole lot of scope for making, uh, helping our clients make more money uh, by optimizing or by making sure that we uh, quote the right price for the right uh, parking lot at right time. So we were very excited. Heathrow was our first client. But soon we, I mean, uh, so firstly, it was targeted for the car parking lots near the airports. So we thought, OK, we, I mean, there, there, there are hundreds of airports uh, in this world. So we were excited, saying, OK, we'll, we are going to get many clients. Soon to figure out that you know, we, the, the, the car parking revenue optimization is not ready uh, to take this uh, as an opportunity to make money. So since 2007, other than Heathrow, we couldn't get any other client. And you know, our, our product went into the maintenance mode. Uh, hardly, I mean, so product was working fine. Hardly there was any support required. Uh, until last year, when we figured out that you know, the market is conducive now. It's, it's picking up the idea of, OK, we can make money by uh, charging the right price for the parking lots as well. So that's where we, we had a couple of clients uh, last year which are already in pipeline, yet not uh, uh, completely onboarded. And so 
product management uh, uh, market facing team you know sat together okay what are the new new things that we want to put into our product you know now our our system is like well, our system needs data the more the data the more granular data you give the better will be our uh, price quotes so they sat together they said okay we have uh, new requirements coming up uh, so which is like get more and more data and uh, make uh, other new features available to the uh, to the end client basically the more data we have the better forecasts we can do the better analytics we can run which okay. basically meant that what the product was doing earlier 2007 uh, versus to 2014 now there's going to be quite a lot of changes in terms of the data we're going to do the uh, forecasting algorithms that we have and so forth and came the first surprise can you guess what could be the surprise? I mean, especially with the fact that we were not having any builds happening for the last seven years. The crash CBS server. I mean, we said, okay, let's start building some features. Let's see, you know, what, where are we right now? Uh, the first thing that we figured out, okay, the server is already crashed. So we fortunately could recover the code base from the backup and we put it into SVN, you know, because uh, we thought at that time, because other products are already into SVN. So that way we can manage all the product lines very well. So we moved it to SVN using the tools available. And just like what you guys have mentioned, the legacy. Here is our legacy of the product. Zero running test cases. No CI, CD. Production scheme, I mean, this is a little embarrassing, but we did not have the production schema uh, checked in. I mean, there are a bunch of uh, scripts which were missing because of which the the database, we were not able to build a database. So seed data was not in uh, good shape. Old stack, JUnit, the version that we are using, one point, yes, I mean, that's the, I've written correctly, it's 1.5. Spring 2.0, and we are using Ant. So that was, that was the situation of our product. And now, I mean, last year we engaged Naresh, uh, so we all were excited to make sure that, you know, we have to go by we have to implement agile engineering practices. How do we do that when nothing is there, right? And that's the challenge, and that's the challenge. I mean, actually, we are excited. Okay, let's take that as, as challenge. The fact is, I mean, business is not going to wait. Uh, it's not going to wait saying, okay, take six months, make sure that the agile engineering practices are in place, and let's take the requirement later. So that's the challenge that we, we said, okay, we, we are up for it. Let's see how it goes. So these were the... Typical engineering practices that we thought we should be having in place, uh, but not by, you know, just do, working on this one. I mean, let's see how, how we went uh, about it. So dev setup, safety netting to the legacy code, test pyramid, clean code, CI, CD integration. So these were the practices we wanted to implement. I mean, these are very basic practices that we want to make sure are in place before we start, you know, jumping in and adding new features, enhancing, while keeping the existing client, which is running, right, that, that product is running. We don't want to go touch that. We don't want to break that stuff while we keep improving these things. Right. So, as an owner, I mean, I wanted to have all of it, right? But I mean, it's obvious. I mean, the, bet we, the more we implement all of it, the better our code will be and the better we'll be able to scale it. I mean, take new requirements and support the new uh, feature development. But our team management, you know, they said, don't forget. I mean, it's all good, right? It's all good for, more, for, for us. It doesn't matter. For us, what matters is we have the business requirements for the new client. When are you going to deliver it? If you say we are going to deliver it next year, we are going to take 12 months to deliver because six months for making sure that we follow the practices for the legacy code and then another six months to actually develop the feature, nobody's going to listen, right? When you're trying to close down two big airports, right? You're trying to close down two big right. clients and you need to, uh, in, in our case, you need to actually crunch a lot of data that comes in from their side, show them some results, show them what kind of improvements you can make. And then basically the deal actually gets closed, which is why he said it's still in pipeline because we run about a six month pilot or a three month pilot before they have confidence in saying, yes, this is actually giving me better predictability than what I can calculate in my head, right? So things like that. Now we are, we are already facing a challenge, right? I mean, we have these engineering practices to implement. Which one to pick first, right? 
I mean, all of them are important. So what we did is, okay, let's figure out, just like product backlog, this is the agility backlog, right? The product backlog, while we are uh, prioritizing the backlog, what we say is pick up the most important item that is, that is going to deliver something uh, fruitful. So we did our uh, sprint zero, what we say, and where we did the backlog prioritization. We sat together for a week or two, two weeks, I guess, uh, and we came up with, okay, let's figure out, these are the things that we are going to implement and tackle one at a time. While we were doing the backlog prioritization, we did some, some few more things, okay? Because we want to really start good, and uh, developers and QA should not be scared about uh, the legacy code. So we spiked out, okay, how do, you, how do we write the workflow test cases? How do we remove the, I mean, we also worked on removing the unnecessary outdated items because now we are moving to agile, you know, having uh, HLD, LLD, uh, EAP project files, HTML mockups, uh, and uh, multi, I mean, there was JBoss instance, uh, the JBoss deployable, which was checked in into the SVN. And so we, we deleted all that code. I mean, we d deleted all that because, uh, simply because it's, a, it's no more required in the way we are moving ahead. Reads output 2.1 GB to 500 MB of code base. I mean, uh, whether it, we, we delivered any business value to it, no, but as long as maintainability is con concerned, it, it has definitely increased. In fact, the first step is to just get a handle on your environment, clean up things, and get it into a shape where you have confidence. So we said, let's actually go do that. Let's, let's get, get rid of the noise and focus on the signals. We also spiked out, okay, how do we, uh, how do we spin up Jenkins and whether the current uh, code base is at least, we are able to build, uh, forget about the running test cases, but are we able to build using Jenkins? So it was pretty uh, quick spike uh, uh, to figure out uh, how, how, how do we go about it. That was essentially, I think, what our, uh, you know, if you will, call sprint zero or like a pre-sprint before even we get started. We, we wanted to sort out some of these things. And then we actually had to prioritize how we're going to tackle some of these challenges. Next. So one of the core principles that we follow is the, like the doctors take the Hippocrates oath, uh, we as software professionals also take the Hippocrates oath, right? First do no harm, right? You don't make the code base from what it was in a much worse situation than when you take over it, right? So what, how do we now go about it, right? So we're looking at, we have spec one, which does a whole bunch of thing. Now we're gonna get the spec two that we need to implement for the new airports that we're gonna get online. Uh, one easy way to do this is to basically go see wherever in the code base you're gonna have some deviation from the original one, put an if else condition, if old version do X, else do Y. And you could actually basically go through your code base, copy in every decision point, and basically have those conditional flows throughout the code base. Tomorrow when we decide to knock off uh, version one or spec one, which we eventually want to, uh, you'll have to go back through the entire code and start looking at where all you had those conditions and then start deleting those. Right? Clearly, I mean, at this stage we said that's not how we want to go about doing things. So we said what we ideally want is to use a better design technique where we don't have to have these uh, if-else conditions, these conditional logic in the code. Uh, you know, maybe we use dependency injection, maybe we use a, you know, as simple as polymorphism, different kinds of things that could rescue us uh, so that we don't have to fall into this trap of if-else, if-else conditional logic. But then Prasad said, if, if I'm going to go and tweak the existing code, how do I know if I didn't break something? The, 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 the last I want to thing I want to do is while refactoring or while making this new requirement fit in, I break existing airport's code base and then you know, we, we lose the existing customer and we don't even get the new customer. So we kind of had that dialogue and we said, you know, uh, we need some kind of a safety net. And we said in the pyramid, uh, the test pyramid that we talked this morning, we want to basically start with the workflow tests. And let's look at at least can we write a few workflow tests which will cover a few scenarios for the existing spec. So we have some handle on what is going on currently. And as we make changes, we want to make sure that remains intact. We don't break the spec one at least. So, uh, that's what I think we decided. We had some challenges of uh, database level things which will come into it. But our idea was to have an environment where I can run 
my workflow tests for uh, the spec one at least before we start going and uh, doing some design changes and things like that. So a few things uh, you can notice here, it was still database, uh, it, it, wa it, it still had information about which database to connect and all. That's, that's what we did not, uh, that's what we thought, okay, let's go ahead with this one. Uh, uh, I, I, I think Naresh was not aware of this one that we are connecting to a database. Yeah. But we went ahead and we said, okay, at least have some safety netting for the spec one. Uh, the next thing that we made sure that, okay, we have written the workflow test case, how do we make sure that they, they run locally at least on every developer's machine because uh, <laughs> if we, uh, hang on, so we'll kind of try to touch upon that because we just finished a session in the morning on explaining all of those. Uh, we should, I'm, I'm afraid we, if we get into that, we might run out of time. So let's assume some kind of uh, business logic uh, validation but maybe we'll explain it a little bit more as we go further. So we identified those test cases saying that no matter what, these test cases should not fail because if they break, which means there is a potential that we are going to hurt the existing client, which is not affordable, oh, right? And so next thing that we did is, okay, we have to make sure that every developer has this uh, test cases uh, running. Locally. So that there. because they are going to touch the code, they are going to modify the existing code. So while they modify the existing code, at least they should be making sure that while they change the code, the existing workflow does not break. Yep. Now all was good, at least uh, we had some good, uh, at least high level safety netting for the spec one. Uh, test cases were running locally. We said, okay, that's fine. I mean, who knows whether a developer, you know, actually runs the test cases or not. And what if it breaks and we come to know after three days saying, okay, the, for the, the check-in which was done three days back by a X developer, actually that broke the code. I mean, there was no, no uh, feedback, quick feedback. So we thought, okay, how about spinning up the Jenkins for it? You know, let's try spinning up the Jenkins. Let's try to make sure that at least as we check in the code, the build is taken, the build is deployed, and the test cases run. If they fail, which means the last check-in has got some issues, right? So we took the approach, okay, let's go Jenkins way. Of course, for spinning the Jenkins and having the build jobs available in Jenkins, we wanted, of course, to have and targets available. So that's the time we spent on and targets. Okay, we had now you can see here we have uh, build CI where it builds the uh, code base into the CI environment. Uh, it's a little different than the uh, local environment uh, because of the parameters that it uses. Uh, then we have a deploy job which will pick up the artifacts which are uh, uploaded into the artifactory. We'll download the artifacts. Uh, and we'll de deploy it in our continuous test box, CT box, that's what we call it. And then we, followed by that, the next job which will get triggered is to run the workflow test cases. So once we have these targets ready, the next thing that we do did is, okay, spin up the Jenkins and have those jobs uh, uh, configured into the Jenkins. So this was the state uh, uh, when we had uh, the things in place, at least now with the check-in, every check-in, these are the things that the, the uh, Jenkins uh, will do that to build, deploy, and at least run the workflow test cases. Yep. All right, so we've got the safety net in, right? Uh, we've at least got some basic safety net in, and we've got uh, that hooked up with CI, so we're getting feedback going now. Now, what is the next step? What is the next thing that we want to attack along this journey of us going along, right? Uh, so we actually had, again, uh, I think I was off for, uh, I work with them alternative weeks, so I was, I was not there that week, and uh, next week when I came in, I was looking at, you know, how are the workflow tests that we have implemented, and what we found was there were places where we were actually going in and basically hooking into the database, doing other kinds of things. We said, well, we'll ignore all of that for now. Let's just focus on refactoring the code, simplifying the code, so we will be able to make progress to adding spec two right now. At this stage, we are good enough. Let's start basically delivering some business value, right? So uh, we started break focusing on three levels of tests. So we looked at unit tests, essentially at the granular level, can we build the safety net of the units? Then we said, well, if you take a set of business objects together, uh, they function, they provide some kind of a business validation. For example, we want to know at what price you want to sell this particular car park lot, right? So that is one set of objects that interact and decide that uh, based on some algorithm. So we said, can we encapsulate that and test it in a business logic? 
Now, the last one was more of a workflow, which is kind of for each, for each of the new spec, we want to ensure that the one scenario completely, which means you kind of get some data on a daily basis, you're going to crunch that data, you're going to generate certain kinds of decision. Uh, there could be scenarios where you don't get all the data, you only get delta of the data. Uh, can you work in those? So there were a lot of different scenarios under which we need to do, and that's the workflow test. So just a very quick introduction, but those were the kind of three levels of tests that we said, let's attack next. And that's what we started focusing on. Sorry? Yeah. We wrote it by hand, yes. Right, so that was the mantra while we repack. Sorry. Legacy code, right? Typically, it's huge. In right. my experience, it has always been huge. So, so just writing unit test cases by hand has never been an option because it's just so big. I would spend like three project teams, large teams, just sitting and doing nothing but writing unit tests for like three months. That's exactly what we want to avoid, right? Exactly. We don't want us to go and start doing a big upfront design, right? What we want to do is, as and when you touch a piece of code, you're going to unit test that, right? So if you notice. We, for the legacy code, we are not uh, basically writing unit tests. We only wrote a bunch of workflow tests, and we stopped at that level. Right? The workflow test helped us understand the end-to-end -end flow of what we want to achieve. This is for the spec 2, the new spec that we're building. We wanted to, to test drive that. Right? So this is at the, that stage. We are saying now that we've achieved the safety net for the existing thing, the new thing, let's start writing unit tests. Uh, and we're not going to spend a significant amount of time trying to build the entire safety net because that's not going to give us the biggest, buck for the, uh, biggest bang for the buck. Right? We want to focus on what parts we are going to be touching and then encapsulate those parts into unit tests, into business logic tests, and into workflow tests. And uh, we have to, uh, so I am a strong believer that using tools that generate tests for you is a disaster because I've been, I've done that, burnt my hands multiple times, and it's, it's not a good strategy. Uh, we can talk a lot more in detail if you're interested, but uh, in this case, we, we consciously decided we're not going to use any generation tools and generate tests. Uh, we, we're going to, wherever we touch, we're going to write unit tests. While you write unit tests, you're actually going to refactor the code. You're going to improve the design. So our purpose over there is essentially to improve the design, not just to write tests for the sake of writing tests. Ten to fifteen percent. So the, the the mantra was: if you are touching the existing code for the new enhancement, try to see if there are test cases available. If not, you know, try to write the unit. And so instead of writing, you know, having a completely horizontal cut, okay, let's write the test cases for the entire uh, thousand uh, class files uh, of the legacy code. We took okay. If we are touching it, what we are going to make sure that okay, let's see if we have we can write unit test cases. Most of the times, it's not possible because. Uh, you know, with the legacy, you can have a method view of 100 lines, right? But then we went ahead to say, okay, let's try to see if we can break it down into unit parts and then write the test cases around it. So that's the approach while, you know, while we are moving, let's see if we can do some improvement on the legacy. So just the incremental steps. So the typical people talk about the egg and chicken problem. When, you, when you're trying to write tests for legacy code, you need, uh, you need to refactor the code, without which you can't write tests. And to write tests, you need to, write, to refactor code, you need tests, right? Now, there is a way out of that is basically by using the IDE to do a bunch of safe refactorings. There's a set of refactorings that the IDE will do for you that does not require you to have the safety net of tests. It's safe refactoring, which means I can do, for example, extract a method. I don't think anything will break. The IDE will warn me if something will go wrong. So we could extract methods. We could move things around. There are pretty safe ways of doing those, and then we could basically mushroom out something, unit test that. So we used a bunch of those techniques to, uh, wherever required, write unit tests. If unit test was not the right level, then we'd say, let's move up. Uh, so the idea was to go as low in the pyramid as possible, rather than starting right at the top and trying to do end-to-end -end tests. Let's run. I think we have. Next one in our uh, wish list was the test pyramid. So I think uh, if you have attended the 10.30 session uh, about, uh, uh, by, say, by Naresh and Sachin, you, you already have the idea. So, unit test, so we wanted to build this pyramid where 70% of the scenarios are covered in unit tests. 
10% in business logic and so on and so forth. And so we wanted to, and why, why we wanted to do that? First thing, first of all, write tests. The test should be written such that they are giving the correct feedback. You know, if my unit level logic is failing, it makes no sense for me that, you know, UI uh, test case is telling me that, okay, something has failed. Reason, why? Because the, if I get the feedback from the UI layer, I am not sure which part, because UI is calling 100 different uh, uh, pieces of the code, but I'm not sure which piece failed, right? So it should give correct feedback at the correct level, right? So that's what we wanted to implement this test pyramid. Another option, another thing, another advantage why we want to do that is to make sure that we are avoiding the test duplication. If something is covered at the unit or business logic level, there is no point in writing an a, again a UI test case. Say for example, we are doing some algorithm, uh, we are running some algorithm at the back end which gives us the output at the front end. There is no point in testing that algorithm in the UI test case when it can be easily tested at the unit or business logic level. Third thing, if we write hundreds of UI test cases, you can see in the 1030 session that the build time goes, goes too much because it comes at the cost, right? You have to load the web driver, you have to log in into the system, access the screen, put a bunch of inputs, and then get, see the feedback. So we wanted to avoid, keep the number of UI test cases to minimum. Yes, sir? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so the, the team is working together on this. We didn't really have, again, the distinction because by now in the organization, we've had uh, the transition in most other places where we are not saying this is a QA department only responsible for this. The people are working together to put this pyramid in place. Correct. That's correct. Just talking yeah. about white box testing. No, it's about the confidence in the testers would increase when they start actually oh, working okay. at the lower layers of the oh, test right, and okay. getting their insights into what is actually getting covered at different layers okay. so okay. they would have more confidence on the overall tests. Right. Right. So you're adding to the advantage yeah. that is listed over here. How do you define code quality? The, uh, the legacy code quality. How was it? It was poor. Okay. Yeah. It was poor. How was it? It was poor. But is there a specific thing like you you want? Like obviously, legacy code is going to be poor, right? No one's going to give you a very nicely written legacy no, code. Yes. Coverage. I'll come to that. There's a slide uh, yeah, there. The thing is, when the code quality is poor, identifying the unit and then having that confidence in the unit is very difficult because you are not writing unit test case on the legacy code you are writing on the newly you know whatever the code that piece that you're touching so just wanted to understand what was the baseline you know. see we were writing unit tests on legacy code as well wherever we touched we would write unit test on the legacy code as well it's not like we were only writing tests unit test on the new code that we were writing because the changes we were making were in the legacy code it was not a system in the side Right? And that's the hard part is that you know you have to actually go in and make changes where you have no safety net other than the workflow test. So there's some safety net by now we had put in place, but we didn't have safety net at the very granular level. Because you know we would have 800 lines methods, we would have you know files which would run into 1,000, 10,000 lines of code. And basically it's just breaking it apart before you can write code, which is what the earlier side was saying, you had to refactor and write unit tests at the same time.
basically at this stage there is one thing that is deployed in production it's running for a particular client we are now building something for two new clients that are going to come on board right and for those we are saying that we are still not deployed it into production for them we are saying how did we go about that so you know regression the way to avoid the long regression cycle was to essentially ensure the core uh, workflows that were being regressed right we basically wrote them we converted them into the workflow tests so we automated those to avoid those long regression cycles to start with that was that that's what that was uh, that's what the point was as to write the uh, right test cases at the right place rather than having you know let's start everything with the ui because if you write ui everything will be covered eventually but in a in a 10:30 you figured out okay it took uh, took us too much time and the regression cycle is too much on another product in the same company it took us 7 hours to run the automated regression tests uh, automated regression tests and uh, we said that's not going to help us and that was only still 40% of the entire code base and uh, there was always catch up game and things like that so that's basically not a good strategy so what we are trying to get here is that we want to move to lower layers and we want to focus at the lower layers now lower layers is fine when you are spinning up a completely new product because you have total control and you can do complete test driven development the challenge here is when i have legacy code and i want to make changes on it then what is this approach or what is the strategy we use so what we are saying just to summarize is we started with a few workflow tests which essentially gave us the safety net for spec 1 the existing uh, specification for spec 2 we said whenever we have to touch any code the first question is can i write a unit test which covers the legacy code and the new thing that i'm doing right so capture that if if that can be done great write it if that cannot be done because of dependencies or other kinds of things then let's move one layer up and write it at the domain logic level if we can write there then perfect that's good we write it and we forget it if we can't do it over there then let's move one more layer up and write it at least at the workflow level now we can get into some more gory details around you know uh, i want to validate something now i don't have access to that i have to dig into the database to find out if what i just did actually made a difference or not right so you know in some cases you couldn't write unit test over there because it's a completely black box algorithm running on let's say a saas deployment right so we had challenges around that so that's where you start moving up but wherever it was java code we could actually rescue it out and unit test it so by this time we all started writing uh, three layers uh, the obvious thing is okay we want to we wanted to make sure that uh, the pyramid stays as pyramid or at least we are building a pyramid that over a period it doesn't become a cylinder uh, a diamond or something like that we wanted to monitor okay how are we performing are we writing uh, seventy percent unit test cases uh, and so on and so forth so we said okay let's figure out if there is a plugin available in Jenkins uh, so we did have one plugin uh, uh, which is called label test group plugin uh, the only point uh, problem was it was uh, grouping the uh, test cases by these uh, terminology unit smoke regression integration and we actually wanted to have our own terminology saying you know we wanted to have unit business logic integration workflow UI end to end XYZ. What we did is, okay, let's try out if we can tweak that code. So we downloaded the code from uh, SVN uh, URL and we tweaked it uh, and we had uh, changed it to make sure that we see unit business logic integration and so on and so forth. I have published that code and also the HPI file uh, on this GitHub link. You can, you can use that if you want. So after using that and configuring the Jenkins further, this was the state. At least we could, we are able to see. Uh, how many unit test cases are written, how many business logic test cases are written, how many workflow test cases are written. So for every check-in it work, uh, it runs and it gives us the report in the, in the sort of pyramid format that we wanted to monitor. Still have improvement to be made to the visualization, but at least it helps yeah. us understand, you know, like out of the total tests, where, how many tests are there, what are those things, how frequently they are getting run, are those increasing, decreasing, are they passing, failing, so it helps you at least visualize that. So that was kind of the first step towards visualizing the pyramid, how are we making progress on the pyramid itself. So this was actually very important for us because while, you know, this was more of a effort to pay off the technical debt that we had inherited, 
We also had to make sure that the business was happy with the outcomes we were providing because otherwise we would lose two big uh, customers. Like one customer essentially is what we have and if you're getting two more customers, that's a big deal, right, for a product like this. So we don't want to basically go off in our own world and keep paying the technical debt and lose the customer. But what we heard from the business because of the approach we took is that they were actually happy with the progress we had made. We had uh, fulfilled a set of business requirements that they had while we were able to at least check off three things uh, you know, to start with or at least make some progress on those three elements that we originally started with. Uh, had we done everything? No, not yet. But at least we were trying to balance the two, which I think is the hardest part when dealing with legacy, is how do you slowly pay off the technical debt and start making some progress in that direction while you also make sure that the business is happy with the outcomes that you're providing. Right, so that I think was a very important step for us to win the business confidence because that, mean, uh, that meant now we could go and invest uh, a little bit more time paying off some of those technical debts. And they could also see some of the advantages because of that, right? Like, uh, you know, they, they saw that there was no issues that were actually getting reported, right. things like that. The confidence went up. I think that's a very important thing is when the business confidence goes up in the team, uh, you know, you can do a lot of interesting things in those contexts. So we picked the next one as the dev setup. I mean, just a little bit of idea about dev setup. The setup we had on individual developer, what we used to do is we used to, okay, if new developer joins, okay, you know, go and copy paste or take someone's help and copy paste the JBoss, MySQL, and all those things on your machine. We also did not have the, as I said, benchmark database. So again, copy the database on your own machine. But that's not the that's not the scalable way, right? As we as we bring in more developers, more QA, we wanted some standardized process by which you know if we. I wish I could have a command where I say ant or maven, whatever is that, so we chose ant because we already had ant. But if I run that command, it will download the JBoss, MySQL, uh, uh, and all those artifacts uh, onto our machine. They, uh, it, it gets deployed uh, with a standard folder structure, and then that becomes pretty simple, right? So whoever joins, it becomes a piece of cake saying, okay, uh, download uh, certain uh, folders and just run the command and it, everything will be fine. So we, we did that activity, uh, of course, our DevOps was involved in that one. Uh, we also made sure that, okay, how, be, the, the database that we had, we did not have the baseline schema. So what we did is we copied the uh, database structure uh, from, the, from the production. We identified what's the basic minimum seed data that is required to run our system. We checked in that code. We have the ant uh, target ready to auto-deploy the baseline plus seeded uh, database uh, onto individual machine. So we made some progress making sure that the, the, the dev setup is streamlined. One of the other challenge that we had is uh, we had this database uh, for running the workflow test cases, we wanted the uh, populated database. Now the thing that we are doing, we used to uh, use the massaged uh, production DB, I mean, re uh, keeping the, uh, the confidentiality in place. We used to uh, use the uh, DB and the, what was the size of the DB? 200 GB. That's not scalable. I mean, we are not, uh, it makes no sense that I'm copying 200 GB of DB on every single developer's machine as the new developer comes in. What we did as to achieve that is uh, we wrote a tool, I mean, in fact, QA wrote a tool to make sure that only the chunk of the database is uh, uh, extracted from the 200 GB, and then only that, ex uh, that another command will actually populate or run those script into an existing database and will make the database ready with only that chunk. The outcome from 200 GB down to 1.7 GB. It's still a huge improvement because which means the developer setup I mean, ready situation is pretty fast. Just a quick check, uh, time check we have. I so think. we have around. Uh, <laughs> no time for questions. Time. <laughs> okay. Okay. So six, six minutes. minutes yeah. Cool. Yeah, so one of the weeks I was back, I noticed that the workflow test that we had actually was digging into the database and starting to, you know, read stuff out of the database. And we said, well, this is not good because as we start building more of these, now you have a very tight coupling with the database structure and with version two or with the spec two, what we were trying to do is actually introduce a lot more things into the database, change the structure of the database, and these tests would become very fragile. So, you know, I, Prasad and I were talking about, you know, like how did you guys slip this in? Like I didn't, I didn't realize this. And uh, yeah. so in Ideas, we also have the hackathon, which is a quarterly event. Uh, we call it as Ship It Day, 
So we picked up this, okay, we have one day, we have 24 hours, okay, how about trying to understand if we can rectify this application? If we can demonstrate just a little piece of it, making sure that the application is scalable or make sure uh, application is ready to uh, support the rest endpoint. We tried that, actually it was a tough night for us, but finally we could crack it and uh, we exposed our API such that, you know, at least for the workflow test cases that we write, we have the rest endpoints ready. And so instead of, uh, instead of hitting the database to understand whether the workflow test case is pass or fail, we use the rest endpoints to make sure that uh, the workflow test cases are now database agnostic. Yeah, one whole long line to just <laughs> get this basic, uh, you know, rest endpoint yeah. enabled uh, because of the legacy versions of things we were using. Now it's not. It, it doesn't directly. The test itself should not directly interact with the database. It should be agnostic. Whether you run the database uh, on your wherever, right, that's agnostic. Because what you want to do is you want to rely on the uh, whatever the application exposes to you. The application internally talks to the database, right? But we don't want the test to also depend on the structure of the database because that makes the test tightly coupled with your existing version of the code, which could move and then the test could break. So that leads to brittleness. So yeah, I think with that we were able to check off another thing which was essentially ensuring that we had the dev set up on the, this thing. I think let's quickly move yeah, to clean code. So we said, okay, we want to, while we move on, we want to make sure that we want to reduce the violations in the system. We want to uh, reduce if else conditions in the stream. How, would, how did we do that? So we spin up quickly Sonar, uh, sonar uh, integration. Uh, we used the Jacko code for integrating with Sonar. And then we at least started uh, seeing the status as to how, is, how good, bad, or worse is our code. I mean, to answer your question, the code coverage still is pretty poor, but from 0% to that percentage, it's still not not as bad as, 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 we, as we can the think. important point is having confidence. Right. Right. I've worked in code bases where, where we had a very huge percent of coverage, but still, you know, the confidence was very low. So I think what's important is having confidence rather than the coverage numbers. You can also see now a uh, number of test cases are going up, violations are coming down. How did we achieve that? So uh, I'll come to that one. So we'll move. Okay. We said, okay, while we do that, how about, you know, covering one more layer of, uh, 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 one more layer of the pyramid. So we said while the workflow test cases and the normal day-to-day -day process is fine or the work application works fine, let's see if we are, we are, let's make sure that we don't break the UI part of it. So we write, you know, around eight, the test cases, UI automation for around Just eight. Just to things. ensure that the, from the user's perspective, they are able to navigate through different things, they're right. able to use it. We don't want to put too much heavy emphasis on the UI test. Yeah. We didn't want to make that portion as covered as well. So it's not integrated right now in Jenkins, uh, but uh, it, we are making sure that it is well within the limits. It just takes one minute for eight screens uh, to cover up. Uh, so, so far, what did we achieve? Basically, at this stage, I think we had a safety net built, so people had confidence in being able to go in and modify the existing code and build on top of it, rather than basically taking copies of it. We were able to get fast feedback when people check in because of the CI and Jenkins integration. Uh, we were able to cover four layers of the pyramid one step at a time. Uh, three are integrated into the CI, one still we are working on that. Uh, but at least we have that feedback cycle put in. And then we were able to standardize the development environment, so everyone's working on the same development environment. It's scalable, someone else comes in. It takes less than maybe a few hours for them right. to be up and running, which used to be few weeks earlier for them to just set up everything on a legacy project. So I think those were the four key things that we were able to achieve. Uh, I think it's been end of December, right? end of December, end to, of December. Till, till now. Uh, and the most important thing, still keeping the business happy about it. So I think we'll pause yeah. here. Uh, yeah, There's further steps and stuff like that, but I do want to give people the opportunity to ask some more questions. At this stage, we have not yet looked at performance tests, but at some right. point we do need to do, do that. Uh, the nature of our application is basically it's a nightly batch job that runs. So per se, performance right now is not a bottleneck for us. But as we start building and scaling more, or, uh, more uh, airports into this, uh, we will have to uh, look at that element. So right now we are not worrying about that.
most of our, so your question is where was most of our business logic? Uh, most of the business logic was distributed all over the place. This is an analytics product which had a whole bunch of stuff happening. Uh, essentially in the back end, if you will, right? Because it's data, a whole bunch of data comes in overnight. We take the data, we crunch the data, we generate a whole bunch of, we run analytics statistics on top of it, and then we generate some numbers, shove it into another database, someone else comes, picks it up. So a lot of logic was in the back end, uh, but we also had some other places where logic had, like databases itself, had a lot of logic in them. Standard development environment was to ensure that everyone's working on the same versions of things. They have things set up in the same way so that when someone comes in new, they, it's kind of similar. I can run things in a consistent manner. Everyone's using similar you know, Eclipse versions with the right set of plugins, all of those things to make sure that the environment is consistent across people. We, he also talked about you know, instead of each one having their own copies of the database, we all work in the consistent copies of the database. So there are, it's scripted now, with the moment you check out code, you run the and task db deploy, and it basically will bring your database version up to the latest and greatest version. Yeah. So things like that, that's basically what we meant by standardizing so like, it. Uh, some, somebody was uh, running JBoss as a console application, some other was running JBoss as a service, that's not gonna help. I mean, in the short term, when we have small size, that's okay, but in the long run, it's not gonna help. So one over there had a question. The UI is, uh, the top layer is to focus on the navigation. So a user could log in, go from one place to another place, they can navigate. Correct. Automation tool as in, when you say all the automation tool, but UI automation tool. Selenium is what we used for the UI. And we wrote six tests, just six, eight, eight, eight tests in total. That's 1% of the entire thing. Actually, other products are already in Jenkins. We have we, we have an active uh, support DevOps already aligned. So it was a pretty simple choice for us, uh, you know, to move it to Jenkins. It doesn't matter what color pant you wear, as long as you wear a pant, I guess. I mean, when it comes to basically focusing on this thing, I don't think Jenkins, Team CD, this that would make any difference. Pretty much all of them provide the same functionality. All right, thank you very thank you much. Guys. We're going to let the next speaker come in. Thank you very much.